If you've even thought of building an electric guitar, you should stick around. We're well into building a guitar inspired by Jimmy Page's Dragon Telecaster. I'm going through the build step by step using the simplest tools and techniques so you can follow along and build one yourself. So stay with me, let's build a guitar! I'm Yav, and this is the Electric Luthier. Today, we'll continue the build of a Tele-style guitar we started in the first three parts of this series. We've already got our body ready for clear coating. A laminated neck is already fretted and mostly shaped. Today, we'll finish leveling, recrowning, and polishing the frets. After that, we'll finalize the shape of the neck. So let's pick up where we left off. Fret leveling is one of the crucial steps to ensure the playability of the neck. It starts with a simple tool called the fret rocker, and it relies on a very simple principle. If you put a straight ruler on any three frets and it rocks, the middle fret is higher than at least one of the other two. Since we can't make any frets higher than they already are, we need to level down the frets to the lower ones. The first step is finding the higher frets which need leveling and marking them. The fret rocker has edges in different length to fit any three frets on the fretboard. And we'll start at the heel end. Put the rocker on the high E side and check if it rocks. If it does, Mark the middle, the 21st fret, with a permanent marker. Repeat this on the same frets in the middle of the fretboard and in the low E side. Now shift one fret up and repeat. Now repeat this 20 times times 3 and you've covered the whole fretboard. Getting the frets leveled is fundamental to the guitar setup and will enable proper and even action later. If leveling is not properly done, there's a good chance some fret buzz will be evident and your setup will be compromised, either with excessive relief or high action to the point of making the guitar uncomfortable to play. When you're done rocking, you'll have all the high points on the frets marked. This can be whole frets or partial. This is also a testament to the quality of your fretting. Good fretting should give you very little, if any, of leveling at all. This also brings me back to the hammer quality. If you look at my marked fretboard, it's evident that I've done a fairly decent job overall, thank you. But the first few frets where I used the toy hammer are completely off. Yes, I blame the hammer. Since I did the rest of the fretting with the most ordinary hammer with a few minor inconsistencies, I do. Leveling. My main motivation when leveling, other than getting leveled frets, is to sand as little as possible. These are brand new jumbo frets and I want to keep them that way as much as possible. Hold the leveling beam with a 400 or 600 sanding paper and start making long and even strokes parallel to the neck. Don't use force. The weight of the leveling beam and your hand will do the work. Try to only sand the marked frets which are higher. These things don't come with an undo button. You can also mark the rest of the frets with another color so you see when they start to disappear and then you know you're starting to sand frets that shouldn't be sanded. The leveling beam is essentially a wide straight edge that has sandpaper or a file attached to it. It's usually made of aluminum 
and comes with adhesive sandpaper. Mine is an aluminum profile I put my hands on. I checked it and lightly sanded it to ensure that it is flat and straight. Then just used masking tape and super glued sandpaper to it. I put two different grits on opposite sides so with two beams I have, I have four different grits I can easily change between. Depending how good a job I did fretting, I should only have to sand very little and only on the selected frets. Because the fretboard is concave, you should only sand parallel to the neck length. Otherwise, you're going to ruin the radius. There are also shorter beams or files which are good for more localized work, like the area I have at the heel. You have to exercise even more caution with these to not over sand one area and ruin the whole leveling idea. Avoid the temptation to attack one stubborn fret with sideways sanding. There's a very high chance of creating a dip on the one fret. Check your work frequently with the fret rocker and mark again what needs to be worked. This process can be repeated a few times until you get it right. Switch to higher grits the smaller your rocking is. When there's no more rocking anywhere, we know the frets are now level. However, when we leveled them, we also flattened the round crown of the fret. Flat frets may cause fret buzz as well as have the intonation point slightly off because it's now not at the center of the fret. This is time for recrowning. Oh, and please hit the subscribe button and the little notification bell beside it to get notified when the next video comes out and do come check my website theelectricluthier.com with plenty of articles on guitar building and more related stuff. Recrowning is the process of filing the sides of the frets to round them back to their original shape. Before starting you should take a look at the frets and mark all the frets that have been filed and need any amount of recrowning with a thick permanent pen. This will later be the indication for our work. It's also a good idea to protect your fretboard from scratches while you work with a file, if you haven't already covered it. If you really trust yourself, or if you've done an outstanding fretting job, and only have a couple of frets to recrown, you can use one of those steel fret protectors. I like the freedom of not worrying about scratches when I work, and I find that the two minutes it takes me to mask the whole fretboard, well worth it. I like using this very thin masking tape. It makes it easier, and I only have to cut the tape at the very last frets. The principle for recrowning is very simple. You sand or file the sides of the fret until the thick mark on the fret becomes a thin line in the middle. You do not want to file the middle line as that will affect the height of the fret and you don't want to change that, we just did. The other two things to look out for are one, don't file in just one angle all the way. You'll get a triangle or fret, not a round one. Start at about 45 degrees for the first part of the filing, and when the thicker line starts shrinking, flatten the file a bit more to round the top part. The other thing is to keep the thin line in the middle at a consistent width. If it's off-centered, so will be the intonation. And if it's not consistent, neither is the roundness of the crown. I do go into more detail about fretting and recrowning in the video about upgrading the fretboard. And I'll link it as usual. You can use a number of fret crowning tools. There are two main group of tools flat files and concave ones. 
The flat ones are pretty much the same files we used for the tips. They can be totally flat or triangular and will have the edge filed smooth to not scratch the fretboard. The concave ones resemble the profile of the fret and have the abrasive part on the inside of the concave part. Both types have version with standard files or diamond files. Personally, I generally prefer the flat type with standard files. The reason is that the flat ones or the triangular ones enable me to see what I'm doing better. And the diamond files I tried were too rough and uneven. I'll be using this simple and cheap one just to show that it can't do the job. I've tried it before and didn't like it too much and I actually used it as a handle for sandpaper which worked better for me than the original tool. I haven't tested all the tools out there and I'll keep experimenting in the future and probably let you know about it. Working with this one takes a few frets to get used to the angle you need to hold it in and how it affects the filing but once you get it, you just go one by one through all the frets that need crowning. Now that we have the frets installed, the tips rounded, all the frets leveled and crowned, we can get to finishing and polishing. I start by first running a 600 grit paper gently over the frets and the tips. I'm not trying to remove material here, and even some of the markers may still remain. From here on, we'll use finer and finer materials with finer and finer grits until we get it nice and shiny. The next step is a 4-0, the finest type of steel wool. I'll rub every single fret from tip to tip, removing all previous scratches, any leftover ink, and bringing it to a nice matte sheen. Do keep the body, or more importantly the pickups, far from the steel wool. The magnets love this stuff. A bit more elegant and slightly more expensive solution, if you can't stand the mess, would be one or a set of freight erasers. They also come in a few grits and you should work your way up from the lower one to the high one. At this point, the frets are really ready to be played. But if you want that extra smoothness and shine for both looks and for buttery string bends, we will go the extra step with compound and buffing. I use this paste that comes from the automotive industry, but there are many others you can use. One of these tubes lasts for a dozen guitars or more. Spread it with a clean piece of cloth, give it a minute, and remove the excess. You can now bring it to a shine with a clean cloth and some elbow grease, or take it to any other sort of buffing. I have this fuzzy 7 inch polishing brush I attach to my sander grinder. After I remove all the residual material, I take all the masking tape off and give it a nice buffing until I get the desired mirror shine. It's now time to finalize the shape of our neck and I'll begin with the back profile. Whether you're aiming for a classic C, a vintage V, a U-shape or any other combination of these, getting a consistent shape manually can be a serious task. You can use a rasp saw or a grinder, a planer or files to remove layer after layer, drawing lines as target angles. I'm going to be using a roundover router bit with a profile of just under an inch or 25 millimeters. It pretty much matches the C profile and even if I want a different one, it will get me there 90% of the way. I'll mount it 
on the table router and run it along the edges. I'll double check and adjust to get the exact overall thickness I want. Because of my extra thick fretboard, I'll need to shave off three more millimeters to get 25 millimeters overall. Then I'll run it in the router again. This left me with a bit of a spine in the middle of the back. I'll shave it off and start some rough sanding to get the smooth profile I want. It's time to get the files out and start sculpting the heel and the volute. I'll mark them and start filing and removing materials until I get to the desired shape. Volutes are the thicker part of the neck where it transforms into the headstock. Aside from being decorative, it also serves the purpose of giving the neck some extra thickness at its weakest point. There are different shapes to volutes and even fenders slightly different variations through the years. And I'd be very particular about it if I was aiming for an accurate replica. I'm going for a general triangular shape for both the volute and the heel. At the heel, I did cut it a bit too close with the router, so the shape will be slightly adjusted to fit that. There's no real guideline to how this type of shaping is done. I start with the files. I don't need anything rougher than that because there's not that much material to be removed. I try and look from every angle and shave off a little bit at a time until reaching the desired shape. It's like sculpting. When that is achieved, I'll remove the file marks with low grit sandpaper and again move up gradually until I get to the 4 and 600 grits. You know you're done when it's so smooth you just want to play it. Going back to my template, I'll mark the position of the holes for the tuners. I keep just the pilot holes in the template and not the full diameter. Always check with the tuners you have before drilling. These vintage tuners need to fit tightly as the front part is held by pressure alone. You don't want them to be too loose and start rattling. And you don't want to have to use glue there. A drill press is a good bet here if you have one and if you want to make sure the holes are accurate at 90 degrees to the headstock. At this point I want to give the fretboard a bit of oiling. I'll first mask the maple. Now some of you may not want to oil their fretboard and many of the traditional woods used for fretboards can do fine without it. My main concern is protection. I don't know exactly where it really came from and how it was treated, so light oiling should give it a bit of liveliness and make it more durable for dust, dirt and stains. I'll use the traditional lemon oil. I'll apply a thin coat with a clean piece of cotton cloth. I'll then wipe off any leftovers. It gets a beautiful dark color and smells nice too. Join me in the next part when we will finish our nut and clear coat the neck as well as the body. Until then, if you want more information about building electric guitars, articles and more, make sure to subscribe, hit the bell button to get notified, check out the links below and come visit us at theelectricluthier.com.